New South Wales. Did his degree there and worked in the steel mills for a while at Wollongong. And then uh, for the last many years, he's been with Hydro Tasmania. Uh, he's involved in some engineering design as well as some commercial transfer when the gas plant from Hydro Tasmania is now owned by Hydro Tasmania, which were transferred from Aurora, which he just told me is transfer of an asset from one government pocket to another. But uh, it still uh, made all the, it was a fairly complicated process. Um, we welcome him uh, to give a, a, an interesting talk uh, on the prospects of, hydro, uh, of Tasmania becoming the battery of the nation. It's working all right? Yep. Thank you for inviting me over here today. It's, uh, I've got a bit of a philosophy on this on this project of which I'm the lead. That uh, one of the important parts of of the process for us is building the awareness of what actually goes on in Tasmania in terms of hydropower because it's pretty low. Um, a lot of people around the nation, when they talk about hydropower, they just think about snowy hydro. Um, so part of the challenge for me uh, is to raise the level of awareness across the whole country around. Um, the hydropower system in Tasmania and what it could potentially do in the new electricity market of the future. Uh, this audience actually reminds me of a presentation I did last year. I got invited to, to go to the uh, uh, Probus Association in Longley, which is in the northwest of Tasmania. They wanted a presentation on Battery of the Nation. And my philosophy is when anyone asks for me to talk about Battery of the Nation, I'll go. Um, and I turned up there and it was a probably a similar sized audience and a similar demographic. but the first question I asked, which I don't think I need to ask today, and the first question I asked those guys was, can you please put your hand up if you used to work for the hydro? And about 50% of them put their hand up very sheepishly. Um, uh, they weren't going to uh, divulge that knowledge, but it gave me a lot of uh, insight as to who my audience were, and they were very, very well educated when it comes to the hydropower system. I even had a gentleman from England who used to work on a pumped hydro site in Wales, and even he fessed up and said he knew quite a, little, quite a lot about pumped hydro. So, um, and, but that was one of the most enjoyable conversations I think I've had on this project for the past two years. I've got quite a lot of slides today, uh, I'm only, only because I just thought I'd sort of take you on a bit of a meandering journey. Uh, you know, I've got a few slides on what I've got, uh, I guess, a commentary on the market itself, the electricity market in Australia, which, which is in an interesting phase. And, and uh, then I'll sort of focus a bit more on, I guess, on the Tasmanian development opportunity because um, uh, it's quite an interesting opportunity down there in Tassie. We've got a significant hydropower system which could add a lot more value to the national market um, in various scenarios. And we've also got a lot of untapped wind development resource in Tassie that, that would complement Victorian and South Australian wind development very nicely if, it, if we can get it up off the ground. A lot of the, I guess, I'm from Hydro Tasmania, but this idea that I'll be talking about doesn't just... Um, doesn't just refer to the Hydro Tasmanian assets. You know, I'll talk a bit about wind development opportunities in Tasmania, and that won't necessarily be Hydro Tasmania. There's a lot of um, enthusiastic wind developers in Tasmania that uh, that are just chomping at the bit to, to do some major development work down there if they could get access to the Victorian market. And I'll talk a bit about interconnection as well, because clearly the big constraint we have at the moment is interconnection. Um, if, if you want to take better advantage of the hydropower system in Tassie on the mainland, we need more cables. So we'll talk a bit about that as well. And I guess I'll be representing TAS Networks a little bit in that, um, who are the market um, network provider down there in Tassie. Let's see if this works. It may not. That's okay. I can always... Okay. A little bit about Hydro Tasmania. And I've got a few pictures in here as well. So I've put in a few pictures of our system. So. Um, it's a little bit of a tourism in Tasmania plug as well. If you haven't been to Tasmania and you've got some time on your hands, you should go down there because it's a really interesting and amazing place. I can say that because I'm not from there and I'm still there. Uh, it's got some amazing um, natural features, but it also has some amazing built features as well on a lot of the hydro Tasmania. Okay, so we're the largest generator of clean renewable energy in the national electricity market. So we generate more renewable energy than Snowy does. That's the first myth I'll bust for you guys today. Snowy has a bigger 
system in terms of capacity, so they have a bigger engine size. They've got about 4,000 megawatts, 4,100 megawatts of hydropower. We've only got about 2,400. But we produce just over a third more energy. And that's because we run more like a base loader in Tasmania. So we have our machines running more of the time than snow does. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. uh, what's probably worth pointing out there is that we are also Australia's largest water manager. So you can imagine if we're running most of the electricity system in Tasmania of hydropower, we've got a lot of water assets under our control. So um, we've got lots and lots of downstream stakeholders um, that have a very, very strong vested interest in how we use that water because they also want to use it. So it's always important to remember if you've never had any experience directly with a hydropower business, that the water is just as important as the power. We've got about $4.6 billion worth of assets about 2,600 and that number of installed hydro capacity. Um, that's, that's sort of at the top end of our capacity um, in terms of what we actually run. It's probably when you take into account outages and, and inflows and stuff, the number comes down to about 2,400. Um, it's about nine gigawatts of output uh, per year. Uh, we average about six terawatt hours in storage. Um, the largest water storage is in Australia. Uh, about 30 hydropower stations. 50 dams, don't ask me to name them all, but I'll show you some pictures of some on the way through. Uh, we do have uh, one gas-fired um, combined cycle gas turbine, and uh, we've got three peakers as well, and that adds up to about 380 megawatts. We use those when it's economically sensible to use them, um, uh, but that uh, project um, that Keith referred to earlier was really the transfer of those assets into our portfolio. Um, we're also a 25% share owner of War North Wind Farms, uh, and they have three wind farms in uh, Tasmania, it's uh, Wool North and Slugland Bay that are right next to each other, and Muscle Road, which is on the northeast as well. So they're the three wind farms that are currently actually up in operation in Tasmania, and there's a few more that are being constructed at the moment. So we participate in the market physically through uh, BassLink, which is the existing uh, link. At the moment it's rated, it's continuous rating is 500 megawatts, it's a HVDC link. Uh, it, it, does at times have a dynamic rating, but we won't go too much into that today, which means that if you operate the power system in a certain way in Tasmania, you can actually increase that, that export and input capacity. But we'll just use 500 today, today because it's an easy number. We also have a retailer in Victoria. So we have one of the more well-established tier two <laughs> retailers in Victoria, which is Momentum Energy. And that's really around, I guess, diversification over the value chain. If we're trading wholesale in, in Victoria, which we do over the, over the link physically, it also makes sense for us to have a retail position there as well. It helps us manage the ebbs and flows of the national market. Uh, we also have a consultancy business that um, some of you guys might be aware of called Entura. Entura have done a bit of work in South Australia in water as well as power over the years. Uh, and um, we employ about 1,100 people based in Hobart, all over Tasmania, Melbourne um, and India actually. Entura have an office in India where they're doing a lot of hydropower work over there. The dam at the top, I don't think anyone here is going to know these dams, but I might as well ask. Uh, Reese, that's the Reese Dam, it's on the far, it's on the west coast. It's the last dam before the Palmen River goes out to the sea, the wild west of, of Tasmania. It's got an amazing spillway for those that are civil engineers. You can't see it here, but this actually comes down like a big ski jump. So when it's in spill like this, you get this massive big spray coming off the other side, it hits the other side of the ravine, it's quite spectacular. If you're ever lucky enough to be that far out in the West Coast on a day when it's in spill, which would need to be in the winter time, which so it will be very cold, you might be lucky enough to see it. The bottom one down here is um, the spillway at Sathana, which is on the northwest. So we have a hydropower system. We've got five different schemes in Tasmania. This is, this is part of the Mersey Fourth scheme, which is in the northwest. And that is Sathana on spill. If, you, if you've seen any of the um, poly political announcements that have been occurring about the Battery of the Nation over the past couple of years, pretty much they've all been happening out here on this little ledge here. Clearly it hasn't been in spill when they've been there, otherwise they'd get very wet and you wouldn't hear them. Um, but uh, that's, that's an important site and we'll talk about Sathana a little bit later because that's one of the pumped hydro development opportunities we have. <coughs> I'll move pretty quickly through this one. Um, I'm just not quite sure the, the general background of the audience, but it's probably worthwhile just having a look at the Australia's national electricity market. It connects Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria, ACT, South Australia and Tasmania. 
Um, it's a very long, stringy network. It's probably the best way to describe it. Um, it's basically a bunch of state-based systems that were then sort of loosely linked together in the sort of 90s and early 2000s to create a physical national market. And importantly, it was built around thermal generation, coal-fired generation. So, um, you know, large centralised generation sources that were built near the resource um, and then very much radi radially fed out from there. And I guess that's one of the big challenges in the market today is because what we're actually seeing is a transition away from that form of generation to new forms of generation. And those new forms of generation operate very differently um, physically, uh, and that's proving to be challenging for the market. Let's overlay that physical challenge with the political, the policy uncertainty. So I don't think I need to describe to anyone who's been around energy in Australia for the last sort of 10 or 15 years that, that it's gone back and forth on lots of different issues and we've had lots of different policy names from renewable energy targets to carbon prices to emissions intensity schemes, low emission <coughs> targets, the Finkel Review, the National Energy Guarantee, the Integrated System Plan. We love coming up with new fancy names to describe what we think we should be doing and then we sort of argue about it for a long period of time and then we come up with a new name which is sort of quite funny but um but um the reality the reality of the energy industry is that it is in transition and it has a very very strong focus from a political and a policy perspective as well um whether that be through um i guess uh, climate change and and how we respond to that um, but also in terms of what the impacts are as we transition away from what we would call traditional fuel sources in the industry uh, to new ones, and that's bringing in issues around reliability and affordability as well. So uh, it's never been a more exciting time to be in the electricity industry. I went through uni in the 90s and no, no university seemed to be doing any courses on the electricity industry, um, and uh, which I found quite disappointing because I was really interested in it. Um, that's why I jumped ship and went to Hydro from the Steelworks in the early 2000s. But I'm really glad I changed because it's the industry to be in these days. It's a fascinating place to be. And then we have the political lens that's really come in. So, you know, we have both sides of politics and we're leading into a federal election that have been uh, putting their policies out there for consideration. Um, uh, this picture on the, in, on the right is a, is a visit from the Prime Minister when he came down uh, late last year, I think it was. Um, so this is our CEO, Steve Davey. Um, this is the Premier of Tasmania, Will Hodgman. Obviously, the, the Prime Minister, that's Richard Colbeck, who's a national um, senator. Uh, from Tasmania, and this is uh, Guy Barnett, who's the uh, State Energy Minister in Tasmania. They're actually sitting on the edge of Lake Plimsoll on the west coast, um, and Lake Plimsoll actually is part of one of our pumped hydro development opportunities as well. That's the beautiful Tyndall Ranges in the background. If you haven't been to the west coast of Tasmania, it's a pretty amazing place. It certainly blew the Prime Minister's mind. He just couldn't believe that this sort of... He said, this looks nothing like anything else in the country, and I was like, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very different place. Um, uh, but... There's a lot of energy in the energy industry these days. Now, this graph is the one that really explains the challenge that's coming. And I don't think, I think as a nation, we're just starting to get our heads around this. This shows you the, uh, I guess, the retirement schedule of our traditional coal and gas-fired assets um, across the whole of the national electricity market. Uh, and uh, it's the bit in the middle that's the one that's probably going to be most concerning. So... Uh, over about, over about 10, year, 10 years, we'll have about 15,000 megawatts of traditional, predominantly coal-fired generation leave the market. Most of that will be in Victoria and New South Wales. And uh, if you thought Hazelwood caused the ruckus when it went out, um, if you look at the modelling as to what happens when you start to lose generators every one or two years that are large, you can just imagine the compounding effect that that actually occurs if you're not ready for it. So um, this, this isn't just a... Transition, this is a transformation in anyone's language. Um, the amount of generation that's going to need to be built, we'll look at that in a second, um, and the amount of storage that will probably need to be built as well is, is, is quite astounding. So if any of you guys that are retired at the moment feel like um, getting back on the tools, just come and talk to me later, because I reckon there's going to be work for you somewhere across all of the eastern states over the next, uh, well, between now and I'd say 2040, 2050. I would never have said that you wouldn't be here by 2050. <laughs> never. <laughs> the interesting thing about this is that this actual schedule is actually is built off a 50-year life for a coal-fired generator. Who wants to hazard a guess the average life of a coal-fired generator that's retired in the NEM in the last 10 years? 40. Close. 
43 years. What's the average life expectancy of a coal-fired generator globally in first world countries? 30. 43, roughly. So, you guys can do this because you're all engineers. Let's just take 45 years, let's be conservative. You just shift this five years that way. That's not very far away. This is one here we put in a plug for you guys here in SA. Um, the, the challenge is already here, and you guys are at the front of it. Um, and that's globally as well. So the, 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 the globe, the energy industry globally is looking at Australia to see how we're going to manage this transition. Uh, because we are actually now starting to experience some of the, some of the highest levels of renewable energy penetration that's, that's going on around the globe. And this is a good one because people obviously often point to Ireland and Texas as having high penetration ratios of renewable energy compared to demand. You guys smash them. So whilst it might, might be produce its challenges on the way through, you guys are at the front end of what's actually a global transition. <coughs> well, yeah, I won't get too much into this one. We could spend hours on this one if you were that, that way inclined. But these are the price spreads on, in the market that occur. So whilst we're all engineers and we would like it all just to be about engineering, there is also a financial market that, that uh, plays a very large role in the way the NEM works. Now, what you actually see is price spreads are increasing. So what that means is that volatility is increasing in the market. Now volatility on its own isn't a bad thing for a market because a vol volatility actually provides signals for new investment. But if you have too much, and dare I say, unpredictable volatility, if you can ever have such a thing, which you can, um, that actually disincentivizes investment because you just can't get enough certainty to make a, a large investment. So it's a fine game we're playing here in the market. How do we actually incentivise investment into the market to ensure that the right technology comes in at the right time? But how do we make sure that we actually don't create so much unpredictability that that investment doesn't occur and in the end, customers are the ones that pay for it? Because in the end, we've always got to realise in the electricity industry, we're, not, we're just a means to an end. We're here to actually produce the lowest cost, most efficient energy we can for the nation because that's what underpins our economy and our lifestyle. And that's what we've always got to remember as we work our way through this transition. Rightio, changing markets. This is a good slide because it talks about all the various physical and technical and operational sort of prerequisites and attributes you need to run a stable system. And this isn't, this isn't dependent on what technology you use. These are the basics or the fundamentals of what you need to be able to do. Now, the two that are changing really, really dramatically at the moment are these two. Because we're replacing a lot of coal-fired generation with wind and solar, and that trend will continue because economically, wind and solar generation, even, uh, even when you take into account the firming costs, are still the most economic form of new generation. Now, that's why it's going to come into the market and dominate the, the system over the next 15 or 20 years, because the market has spoken, if that makes sense. Um, but that creates some real challenges because it makes it harder to forecast power system conditions and it's hard to be confident that your forecasts are actually good. And also the ability to manage generation and dispatch and configure services to maintain security and reliability become immeasurably harder. Because you have shifting demand and you have shifting supply. And they're both shifting in very different ways. So if you're a power system engineer, your job is becoming a lot more complex than it used to. Talk to anyone in IEMO and they'll tell you that that's the market operator. They spend most of the day scratching their heads how they're going to manage this, some of these issues that come along. So importantly, one of, the one of the parts of the solution is we need to be able to firm this new variable renewable energy. That doesn't mean that you make it look like a coal-fired generator, because you don't. What you've got to make sure is that if you go back to the fundamentals of a power system, you need to make sure that dynamically you're matching supply and demand. So making it look like a coal-fired generator actually isn't probably going to help you because the demand side's changing as well and you've got embedded generation and it's all over the shop. Actually, what you've got to get back to is the fundamentals of how technically do you actually make sure that you can match supply and demand at any given point in time? And then how do you create financial markets that actually then reward the investment required to bring the assets to the market that will allow you to do that? The basics, the fundamentals are the same, it's just how they show up. So you've got to sort of peel back and go back before... Uh, we had coal-fired generation embedded in our mindsets and think about it um, from basic fundamentals, which 
whose knees hard to do. Oh yeah, this is the other graph I love to show. This came out of the ISP, which was the integrated system plan that the AEMO, which is the market operator, released the first cut of it last year. And shows you what they think is going to happen. And this was on a 50-year coal-fired generation retirement schedule as well. So you can imagine that if you wound that five years to 45, you'd bring all these changes forward five years. But this gives you a really good indication of the change in the energy mix. Importantly, though, it's introduced some new colours in the bar graph. It's introduced the purple and the light green. So the purple is large-scale utility storage, and largely speaking, that's pumped hydro. And the green, the light green, is distributed storage, which largely speaking is batteries. So the numbers over here, I won't make you work them out, but that's about 17,000 megawatts of utility-scale storage they expect will need to come into the market. And that's about 5,000 megawatts of distributed scale storage. How much of that's in the market now? Very, very little, pretty much zero. Very, very little, because that doesn't include the existing traditional hydropower systems, that's a different category. And interestingly, if you go on this retirement schedule, you need to build about 12,000 megawatts of that 17,000 megawatts of large scale utility storage in an eight year time period. Who thinks that can be done? Yeah, it's not. Think about it. Snow is 4,100 megawatts, and think about how much time and effort was, was, was required to build that. We have got 2,500 megawatts, and we, we built that over almost a century. Um, the idea that you could build that, that amount of, of large scale utility storage is sort of, you look at it from an engineering and constructability and a commercial perspective, and you go, we need to come up with a better plan. We need to somehow work out how do we actually stretch this out and start this earlier. Because if we don't, we could be in a lot of trouble. Is that based on the same estimated demand curve, though? Yeah, the demand, largely, AEMO's view is that the demand largely stays flat. It doesn't go up or down, and, and there's a lot of variables in there. Well, South Australia is demonstrating that that's going to go to zero. Uh, at times, yeah. So it goes... Potentially. There's a difference between average and... We'll look, we'll look at that in a second. There's a difference between instantaneous, because you're right, instantaneously it can drop to zero but it doesn't get zero all the time. Yeah, so but for extended what? periods of time, it will be at zero in the not-too-distant future. Is that a blackout? No. <laughs> Apart from blackouts, which have been around long before we'll, renewable we'll energy. I'll hold that thought, because um, I can tell you, this, this conversation would go for hours and hours and hours, and I'd love to have it go for an hour, hours and hours, because I love the conversation as well. Um, but the important thing is that storage is a new technology, and it is a new service that's required. And the reason why it's there is because you're going to have these new generation sources that you don't dispatch like you would traditional sources of generation, um, and you're going to need a lot of it, a lot more than demand. So you're actually going to need ways, to, if you want an economically efficient system, you're going to need to work out ways to store that energy and be able to shift it in time to match supply and demand. If you don't store it, the only option you have is to use gas-fired generation or reciprocating engines and that sort of stuff and then actually constrain off this generation. So you've heard of the 40,000 rollout of batteries in residential mm -hmm. South Australia? No, I'm not saying batteries won't be needed. So batteries will definitely be needed. Um, certainly, you know, our view is that you're going to need significant rollout of batteries. And we'll talk about the different roles they'll play, but you'll also need a significant rollout of pumped hydro investment as well. Yes. Mm. Audio, in the case of pumped hydro. This is not one of our sites, by the way, but this is a really good this is a really good illustration of a pumped hydro storage um, facility in Europe, and I'll talk about it in a second. The case for pumped hydro. It's not just flexible supply, it's flexible load. And that actually could be really, really important um, in, in the future market because other sources of firming don't give you that, don't give you that ability to optimise a system. Um, asset life, they're long life assets, 40 plus years. I mean, we've got assets in our system that are 80 years old now in terms of traditional hydro. That provides challenges because how do you actually get an investment business case up for a 40 to 50 year asset um, in a market that is so volatile and so unpredictable. Long duration, we'll talk about this in a second. We think the market's gonna need short duration storage support and we think it's gonna need long duration. And when we talk about long duration, we're talking about up to days. And if you look at wind profiles, it is days that you may need this sort of storage. Um, you've got all sorts of options around ancillary services. So if any of you guys here are electrical engineers and get into turbine designs, it's a whole other science. 
There's so many different sorts of pump turbines. You can fix turbines, fix pumps, variable, variable speed turbines and pumps. You've got ternary units that can change instantaneously and provide all sorts of power system ancillary services. The list goes on and on and on. You just got to work out what the market actually needs. That's the problem. Uh, and also, it's also clean. Um, if you if you form the view that this is going to be important in the future, well then pumped hydro can play a really important role. This is actually a site in Europe, and this is a really good example of a pumped hydro unit that this is similar to some of our opportunities. This is a very big existing reservoir. You can see it's on an existing lake, on an existing river, sorry. Uh, and they've built a small off-stream reservoir and they basically pump and generate between the two. So the technology's been around for 100 years. It's, um, it's just that we've never needed it here in Australia. I mean, interestingly, pumped hydro cut its teeth in, in systems that were, predominant, that were predominantly nuclear, because nuclear can't move around. So you see a lot of pumped hydro in Japan, Europe, and America, where they were balancing, they were balancing nuclear fired power stations. Not that I'm suggesting that's going to happen here, but that's the reason. Right, yeah. I won't spend too much time on this, this one, because this one actually, uh, you could spend an hour on each of these questions. Um, uh, the change that's coming is actually challenging us all to think completely differently about how the power system works. And I'll give you some examples. This idea of baseload generation, I mean, does it actually have meaning in the future market is a, is a really good question. Um, firming, what is firming? The definition of firming is not set. Go out there and try and find me a stock standard definition of what firming in an electrical power system means. You will get us, five different experts, and you'll get five slightly different answers. Capacity versus energy. So we only have an energy market in the, in the national market at the moment. So, um, uh, and that was based on the system, <coughs> the physical system that was in place when we built the financial market, if that makes sense, over the top in the 90s. But it's a strong case to say that actually capacity as a service in itself, so short time period, think about it, I like to think about it as <coughs> drag cars versus long haul truckers. So energy is your long haul truckers and they're the, they're the ones that are there operating all the time. But we may find we actually have the need for a lot of big drag cars in the energy system of the future. And pumped hydro make really good big drag cars. Um, inertia has always been plentiful. So if anyone who knows about inertia in a system, got lots of big bits of spinning metal. If you have issues, you sort of ride through them because you've got so much inertia in the system. But if you start to take those machines out, and you replace them with technologies that are producing energy into the system that don't have that physical inertia, well, you've, got a, you've got another problem to sort out. Um, I like to use the analogy there, it's a bit like riding a bike. If you ride really, really slowly and you hit a small rock, it can actually knock you off. But if you've got a lot of speed up and you hit a small rock, you sort of don't even feel it, you go straight through. Um, inertia is going to be a really interesting issue for us. And interestingly in Tasmania, we've dealt with this issue for quite a while. Because if we have Baslink on full import and we have the wind blowing a gale and we have a very, very small amount of hydro generation, we actually have to have a lot of spinning reserve as an issue in the system. Give them a nudge. Give them a nudge. It's that time of the afternoon. Um, uh, look, there's another whole bunch of other stuff in the end. I won't get into too much of it, but the really interesting thing is that we're really being forced to challenge the way we think about the market and how it works. This is actually another one of our power stations. This is a live Peter power station on the Derwent. So it's a run of river system. Um, and all that water that runs through those power stations ends up in Hobart. Audio. Who can time check? Time check. Okay, cool. Okay, a little bit of a little bit of a, a couple of slides on, on capacity and how things are changing. So if you have a substantial base load. Uh, in terms of generation, you sort of look like this. So the flexible capacity you need is relatively small in terms of balancing the unders and overs. But what happens if your generation profile looks like that? Now that's quite extreme to prove it, to, to make the point. But what do you think that is? Solar. So all of a sudden, you need flexible capacity of around five and a half thousand megawatts. Difference between the two? Managing that sort of energy system is going to be a completely different ball game to what we've had to do in the past. And that's why the idea of flexible capacity, um, and admittedly, if you can actually store this stuff, if the, if the yellow line actually goes over the blue, the ability to store it as well becomes an economically efficient solution as well. As it says in the bottom there, this is the start of the business case for storage. I talked a bit about this in terms of challenges in the system in terms of storage. So 
there's a whole range of requirements that are going to be. So really, you've got to look ahead and you've got to say, we're not talking about a system that's got 70% coal fired generation, which is what we have now. We're talking about a system that'll have 50 or 40 or 30% traditional thermal generation. And these are the sorts of storage requirements you are going to see emerge. That's why we say we need to bring on and find as many pumped hydro development opportunities across the eastern seaboard as we can. Because you won't be able to develop all of them, but you're going to need to develop a whole bunch of them and you're going to need to have them as quite long duration supplies. So batteries are never going to supply these ones down the bottom. What about pumped hydro in South Australia? You guys got a number of opportunities on the run. Um, you know, I think you guys have got four or five different opportunities. Um, all around about 200, 250 megawatts, all around six to eight hours of storage. We're watching them closely. Um, our view, though, is that in, in, there's going to be a lot of it. If you go back to the original diagram, there's going to be a lot that needs to be built. So uh, we're certainly watching um, very closely the, the, the opportunities that are under assessment at the moment in South Australia. And you guys actually got a couple in the shortlist for the federal government's underwriting um, program as well. So, yep, yeah, they're, they're interesting um, sites. And our insurer guys, our consultancy guys, are actually working on a couple of those as well. So, But the thing is that there's lots under assessment in the market that are around six to eight hours. And then there's Snowy, it's got like 170 hours, it's an outlier, it's down here somewhere. But our opportunities all sit here. And we think that's going to be a really big sweet spot for pumped hydro development in the future. Um, one, because we've got a number of opportunities that sit there, and two, we think a lot of it's going to be needed. Three, a lot of the ones that are under development now are all six to eight hours, both in South Australia and in Kingston and in, in far north Queensland, it's the same, they're about six to eight hours. Audio.